Okay, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the second and final ADP milestone meeting. We're not done yet with ADP. However, um, this is our last milestone meeting. I just want to update you on a few things and then we'll get right into the presentations because Tracy and Jim have class at one and we want to make sure that they get to share their information about what they learned. So short agenda, um, participations will take up most of the time that we have allotted for this presentation. Um, and I just have a few quick reminders before I allow you guys to come up and chat. Um, you don't really need to read this slide, but these are all the requirements of ADP and the ones that are sliding across the screen are the things that you've already done. And these are the things you have left to do. Um, so completing a peer faculty review. Um, the faculty, the peer review is different than the Quality Matters review by us. Um, some people were confused about what that means. They're basically just reviewing your content to make sure it meets the department's expectations and, you, and the course description. So choose somebody in your department to do a peer review of your class. Um, you can put them in your course, however you see fit um, as a student instructor um, so that they can go through the course and look at the content information. Um, obviously offer the course, the hybrid or online course during the summer session um, when it's ready to be deployed. And then we'll send out, um, probably after the final QM review, we'll send out an evaluation of the entire process because we want to get your feedback so that in the future we can improve um, these programs for future ADP participants. So not a lot left to do, it might be time consuming. And I've already talked about it, so they're not, the peer reviewer is not reviewing your design, that's more of us, um, and we're looking at some of the content with the QM, they're just looking at the content. So they can't say, oh, your banner is ugly, take that out, <laughs> something like that. Um, we just want them to review the content. Yes. And then they're going to contact you, or they just talk to They you? would just talk to you. Just us, yeah. Okay. There's no formal, like, you know, they have to do this, this, and this, like we have for our QM review. Okay. Um, you know, because every department's different with the expectations they have, so it'd be kind of difficult to, to set that up. Yes? So um, I already had mine reviewed by a peer in American Studies. Should I forward that email to you? Yep. yep. Okay. Good job. Right awesome. All right. So now it's time for presentations. Yay. And Tracy's going to go first, and we're going to plug in her live chat. Okay, so um, my big problem, so I teach uh, Bio 466, uh, which is population and quantitative genetics. Um, and this is a summer course. We usually do it only over the summer. And I'm currently the only person that teaches it. It hasn't been taught in over 10 years in the bio department. Um, so my big question was, how do I engage students with real world lab applications on evolutionary time scales? Because we know that students obviously learn science by doing science. Um, but in this particular class, we are constrained, obviously, by a very uh, limited amount of time. Um, it's a six-week course over the summer. Um, the classes are three hours in length, three days a week, typically. Um, and it's also really, really difficult to do experiments on evolutionary time scales. Um, so just the content itself isn't, doesn't really lend itself to doing experiments. But since we know students learn uh, science by doing science, um, I tried to add a virtual laboratory component um, where students would actually do laboratory simulations. Um, so last summer, I incorporated this piece into my course. Um, and these lab, these lab simulations are wonderful. They're fantastic. The only problem is they're really, really long. Um, they come with a workbook that is 35 pages in length, and it's awesome. The students love it. It's just that they couldn't finish in three hours in class. Um, we were in class many days until five o'clock in the evening um, and students sometimes still didn't finish uh, so it was a big problem for me how do I how do I have the students do something um, I know this works this is a great laboratory component for the course we just don't have enough time um, so my answer was I really wanted to hybridize the class um, so I wanted to make this laboratory component more self-paced and available online so that they could complete certain exercises um, you know, on their own time. So they didn't have to do it in this four hour chunk where they were rushing to finish. They had, you know, kids to get home to or, or something they needed to do. Um, so this was my goal. And what I did, go to my course here. So this is my Blackboard page. And what I did was I incorporated um, this hybrid component 
So this program is by SimBio, it's called Simutext. So they have to download this on their own computers. And then I added a, a video where just to show them how to use this program, this Simutext. Um, and then here's all their simulations that they're completing each week. So in the beginning of the simulation, I just have a video for them to watch, um, just providing some background about what they're going to be learning in that particular lab. Um, and then they have, of course, the workbook. And then they go to the Simutext, and they complete everything from their computer. Um, and then I set up a Dropbox. So every Sunday evening, their assignment, their workbook, and then they also have a quiz to complete um, after the assignment every week. They're just going to drop it into this Dropbox um, by Sunday at 11.59 PM. So I think this is a really good way, we're going to find out, um, for them to do the laboratory component in the course to, to get that uh, kind of hands-on. It's Even though it's a simulation, it's more hands-on than just reading this out of a book or something like that. Um, and then next steps. So this semester, this summer, I currently have uh, structured the course so that it's 33% online, 67% face-to-face. So most of the course is still face-to-face. -face. I think my goal is to make it more of a 50-50. Um, so I'd like to do more of an online component for this class. Um, I'd really like to flip the classroom such that they're doing a lot of the lecture material at home and then they come in and um, the way I have the course structured now is the first half of the three-hour session over the summer is lecture. Uh, and then the second half, we go to the computer lab or um, we read uh, to, to work with real genetic data, so they analyze real genetic data, or we um, read a paper, have a paper discussion, or problem set in a team or something like that. But I think a lot of this could be front-loaded online in a, more of a flipped classroom, so that lecture component could really come before they get to class, and then their time with me would be spent working in groups. Um, rather than me just lecturing to them. So I'd like to do that. Uh, and in addition, something else I've learned from this ADP, I've already incorporated into the two courses I teach now, Bio 142 and Bio 300 Lab. Um, we've done a lot of things in there. We have a lot of our assignments uh, turned in on Blackboard. We're doing Blackboard quizzes, uh, lots of videos, especially on those snow days. It was really nice to know how to do that tech relay um, so that they, were, they didn't miss anything on those snow days. We did everything um, on Blackboard. So I have learned a ton. Um, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I know we talked about with your, um, the, when you're aiming for the 50-50, you have a lot of like a little bit longer lectures and you kind of have to figure out how to break those up. Yes. Into yes. So, time. yeah. So the lecture, it's, it's difficult to know. So the way, so we do 300 lab now, we have five minute videos and how do I break up these long lectures into five minutes? Um, it's a, it's, it's a working process. So we're figuring it out in the bio department, I think. We're, we're definitely working on flipping a lot of the things we do, but it'll take time. Anybody have any questions? What, what do you feel like is holding you back from the 50-50 and going to a flip classroom? What do you feel like would be the next step? So for this summer, the only thing that was holding me back was the schedule was already determined. Um, so I was already meeting face-to-face -face with the students two days a week, and then that third day is what we put online. Um, so I, I felt that it was maybe unfair to the students um, to have a huge online component when we have, in addition to all this face time. And I also wanted to give myself time to just work into this. Um, so my goal is to get to the 50-50 and to flip more. I think I just need, I need to do this this summer and then next summer um, add more to it. So taking scheduling out of the equation, what what would the experience, how would that change the experience for the students? I mean, what, you know, it's preaching to the choir here. Right, right. <laughs> kinds of things, but uh, why, why would that be better, or what, what do you think would be gained from it? So I, I don't think students know this, but um, the first exposure is really important, um, and I don't think the first time they hear something should occur in the classroom with me. I think uh, the first time that they, we try to get students to do this, we assign reading assignments, but so few of them do these reading assignments ahead of time. Um, but I think it's really important that they are exposed to this new material at home where they have time to think about it, digest it, take notes on their own time, and then when they get to the classroom, um, 
it's more time one-on-one -on -one with the instructor so that we can give feedback and they can ask those higher level questions and we can do this higher level work rather than just give them information in lecture format. So I, I think it's a, it's a strong benefit to them for their own learning. Um, but I also think uh, having this hybrid component um, will allow more students to take the course because some of them just can't go to class for nine hours a week during the summertime. It's just not, it doesn't fit into their schedule. So if they can do this self-paced and on their own time and, and they don't ha have to crunch all this into a four hour session, I think more students will actually take the classes. Are you concerned about them being accountable? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, this is a 400 level class. I think in a 100 level, so I've thought about how do I do this in my Bio 142 class, which is an intro bio course. I'm worried about them because so many of them just, they're not motivated. Um, but I think in a 400 level, we don't have that problem. Could you uh, speak to just how you use ScreenTest during the past term, um, like the practical duration, how you use that for your courses, and how would that look the same going forward for your hybridization incorporating it to uh, the current course or other courses? ScreenCast? Your text oh. So my tech relay? Tech text relay making screencast capturing right. video yeah. content for um, deployments within your course. How are you using that this, during the spring term? And was that just like kind of like I recorded the whole lecture? Right. Matter of necessity? How would that be deployed mm -hmm. if you were trying to do something like a book classroom? So this semester was the first semester I used, and I, as I said, it was great for snow days. Um, we didn't miss anything. We just recorded the whole lecture and they got that. But I also, um, what I also <clears throat> did this past semester. So we have an active learning component to Bio 142, uh, where they meet in the castle and they do all this active learning hands-on stuff. Um, but we only meet for an hour and 15 minutes. So by the time they finish the active learning activity, there's not a lot of time to kind of summarize what they did and kind of wrap it up. Um, so I was trying to begin the next lecture with a summary of what they learned, but then I found I was running out of time in lecture, couldn't get through what I wanted to get through. So what I ended up doing was um, I would record a just quick summary, uh, no more than 10 minutes about what they learned in active learning. And I would post that after every active learning activity that they did, um, which would just summarize and would also, so they had um, kind of higher level questions that they had to answer afterwards. So we'd, we'd talk a little bit about how to go about answering those higher level questions, which were due the following Sunday. Uh, but all that was done on the Tech Relay, um, posted on Blackboard. So that's how I've used it so far. In my 300 lab course, um, we actually, so that is more of a hybrid course, uh, we actually introduce all the lecture stuff. So we go over skills and techniques that they'll be doing the next week in lab. This is how you pipette. This is how you do a dilution, whatever. All that is on Blackboard um, in five minute chunks. So they're just labeled. Um, this is how you, you know, this is this technique. So they can watch it as many times as they want to watch. And that's great because so often, you know, you show students this is how you do it, but in class they only see it one time, they miss something, uh, but they can go back and watch these videos to review for exams or, or whatever they're doing, um, and they seem to really like that. 300 Lab has had really great feedback about the videos we post online. Uh, and then to, what was your other question about flipping? Um, well, well, you talked about how you recorded your, your full lecture. Yes. And Uh, did you chunk it? And did you do the same approach going forward? So right. You have, like planning uh, time on your side. Right. So I had to do it in 15-minute chunks because inevitably I would make a mistake and then I'd have to start over. So just for me, I had to do it in 15-minute chunks. But I also think that's really important for students because they're not going to sit there for an hour and watch a video. Um, but that seemed that seemed to to work well. Most of my this is a 100-level class, so. Most of my students watched those 15 minutes in the chunks, um, but I know a number of them didn't, and I'm not sure how to, how to make them all watch the video. Um, perhaps having a quiz at the end of these snow day lectures would have been um, beneficial to make them actually watch it, but I could tell on their exam scores that some of my students did not. So, yeah, have to think of something to do with that. Well, I have, so I have a lot of adaptive release set up, yeah. but another, another, okay. That sounds good. Okay. All right, thank you.
<laughs> Maybe we'll see. Maybe she might be right. Thank you. Oh, did you need your plug? Oh. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Oh, wait, does that does that go? Oh. Oh, then we got switch. So yep. Now we pray. So can I close this? Yeah, you can close it. So I just put this on top. Uh, wait, so I need to figure out how do you start this thing. Wait, don't laugh. This is very serious. Okay, so uh, I'm Jim Thomas. I've been teaching here since the early 50s. Um, just in a field. They built the buildings. I came in. Uh, I've been part of the philosophy department for 14 years, and I've started teaching for INDS, Interdisciplinary Studies, about three years ago. I teach a course for them called uh, Ways of Knowing, which is about how to take different disciplines and combine them, integrate them to solve particular problems or address certain sorts of issues with big explanations. Um, the course has uh, only been taught, except for once during the summer, uh, only been taught during the regular semester. And so the difficulty for me when they suggested uh, a hybrid course was how to condense this into a six-week course. Uh, but also, uh, as I went through the ADP process, I saw the, uh, uh, the sorts of things that I, I needed to learn, none of which was, was this. but. Uh, the way in which I had approached creating the syllabus and the way in which I had structured courses beforehand. And so in addition to learning how to hybridize a course, what I mostly gained from uh, ADP was a better sense of how to create a syllabus and how to structure the course around that. So uh, to give you sort of an idea of what my old syllabus looked like, it was just a title and the date and then and this is uh, a quote from the, uh, the first one, almost verbatim, where uh, I just sort of just laid out what we were going to do. It had not occurred to me to list objectives and goals because I thought this would come out organically as the course went on. As I said, I've been teaching for over a decade and uh, it had never been suggested or never occurred to me uh, a better way of, of doing this. Uh, so, uh, uh, my syllabus wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty close. So I said I could make assignments, I could set dates for exams, I could uh, try to answer questions about uh, uh, what the course would cover. Uh, and I started to use Blackboard in the last couple of years, but it was mostly just as a delivery tool. Here's the documents, there's where they are. So now you don't have to buy a textbook, go there. But it was going through the ADP course that uh, I learned about other things. So didn't know the difference between goals and objectives. This was my original list of objectives for the course. And I'm not going to leave this up here very long, but just it's, 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 just, it's a list. And uh, the thing that comes out of this list is that, uh, seriously, uh, <laughs> so now I know there's a d distinction between goals and objectives. Before, um, I was just sort of listing kind of the, the main points I wanted to hit in each course and not really uh, anticipating the students' need to understand why we were going through it the way we were or even what was expected of them uh, each week. So now I have goals, which they can see, and this is on my current syllabus for the uh, summer course, and I have the uh, individual objectives uh, underneath those. These here are color-coded because as I was going through the process with the QM rubric, I found it easier for me if I would color-code what my goals were 
So then as I looked at each individual assignment within the syllabus, I could assign it a color to see, do I have enough of each color? Am I favoring one more than the other? Is some assignment, I don't know how to color it, then it, it was a way for me to edit as I was going. All right, so the differences to take away from this. My earlier objectives were just with this hodgepodge, where, because I didn't know much of a difference, uh, I would just come, kind of just put things down. But I've learned how to think long term with the goals, short term, week to week with the objectives. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, my old syllabi, I just, I just told them this is what we're going to do in the class. And now what I focus on is what I want the students to gain from the course. And I want them to be able to see this in a clearly laid out fashion. Uh, so, I'm going to put this in action. Let's go to Blackboard and see if this actually works. Uh, that's a picture of my son. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's uh, I am a horrible teacher. This is <laughs> all right. Oh, so I might have to extend this. So sorry. Uh, there you go. Yeah, uh, all right. So just to give you an idea, I'm gonna sit just for this part. This is uh, what the old class looked like, and just it's a basic sort of layout where I have just announcements and the syllabus and the course documents. And that was pretty much all I used. And just to give you an idea of course documents, it was just a list. And it was broken down by a week. But within each of these weeks, it was just the, uh, the readings that were going to be covered for that week. So they would know where to go. But now, having gone through ADP, I can show you the Blackboard course that I'm working on for the uh, summer course. I um, start with an announcement that will be pointing the students so that they know how to use Blackboard. And then at the uh, Start Here site, I have instructions to how to use the uh, Blackboard site. A lot of the students that are coming to INDS are, uh, a number of them are professionals, but a lot of them have not used Blackboard before. Uh, how to use Blackboard for the course, an orientation video, and then an orientation video quiz. The quiz uh, addresses what's covered in the video. This is a fill-in now. I'm working on a TechSmith Relay to do my own. But once they complete the quiz, it then releases the uh, information for the rest of the course, which is over in course materials. And uh, each week now is broken down. I'll just go to week one so you can see. So I have a set of objectives set up. Now, this currently is too wordy, but my background's in philosophy, so too wordy really doesn't make much <laughs> sense to us. Uh, in fact, I, I think I've left out a lot of things. It's very problematic to me. But uh, Tom continually tells me that today's undergraduates are, I think you said, functionally illiterate and uh, <laughs> I'm on camera now having said this uh, but so I need to try to make the bullets more bullet bullet ish uh, uh, more pointy and how they work instead of less cannonball-y uh, but so there's the objectives for each week about what's going to be expected uh, about when they need to do what's expected of them the readings are underneath. Uh, this is not in student preview, but uh, uh, so what the reading is, there's a quiz. They complete the quiz. It releases the next reading, which has a quiz, which releases beneath, so that they are gaining the understanding as they're going through the week, so that then they're prepared for what we will discuss in the class. But by taking the quiz, they at least should be prepared to begin work on their first essay, which will be submitted through Blackboard. And then we repeat week through week. And it's a building process so that each week's objectives, we can go back to the syllabus to see how it fits in, the way in which it fits in, ideally, if it does. So what ADP has done for me is not just help me figure out how to hybridize the course that I thought would be almost impossible to hybridize, but it's really helped me figure out just how to rework all of my syllabi for all of my courses. Uh, uh, I don't know there's really anything that could be done about how ineffective a teacher I am, but I think that this now can at least give me nice looking paperwork. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Thank you.
you know, no, no questions, all that. Just <laughs> so what I try to do is just just denigrate myself enough so there's just pity and then people are just like, oh, yes, ma'am. Are there certain things that you are going to have your students doing outside of class? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. So a lot of what interdisciplinary studies uh, uh, focuses on is how to solve a problem. So during the regular semester, we go through a number of examples in class. And so one of my worries about hybridizing this was sort of losing that kind of issue. So each week there will be a discussion topic where they will have to talk about a particular sort of application of the ideas that they've covered either in the readings or in the class discussion. And they will also be required to comment on other students' uh, ideas as well so that I will hopefully be able to generate an out-of-class discussion that we can then carry over into the face-to-face -face course. So it's a writing intensive course. They will have to write two-page essays every week but I want them also able to explore these ideas in a less formal kind of setting, and that's what I hope to get from the discussion board. Oh, you're just talking about it. Anything else? No? Yeah. <laughs> this is my first time. I've never done PowerPoint before, so yeah. No, no, thank you. I just, I just Googled ADB PowerPoint and downloaded this and just... Oh, now it's a thing. So I'm having students do presentations. Um, so we have 70 students in two sections of my 200 level class, and every single person did a PowerPoint. And it makes me think they wish I did them. <laughs> but I don't. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through um, my Blackboard course. And my PhD is in rhetoric, and I am just a sucker for grammar. I love grammar. I love writing. I think of grammar as. Um, is actually productive of thought. Uh, often when I'm writing, I use grammar, you know, well, it's not this or this, but it's this as like a placeholder, and then I fill in the blanks. Um, so what uh, I'm gonna talk about today is using the module structure um, that we talked about in the ADP workshop because it's, um, it, it's what really helped me reorganize my course. And like you, I did a lot of, um, having to answer the questions from the ADP, uh, uh, sort of the quality matters rubric and designing it really helped me build a course from the student side up because um, just like you I've been teaching for about 10 years um, for over 10 years and my when I first started teaching it was like what are my favorite books let's read them and have a conversation about them then I went through some faculty development at my previous institution where I learned about learning goals and objectives but it wasn't until ADP that um, I actually was actually able to concretize those um, because you have to, I think, for an online or hybrid course to work well, there's so many layers of explanation you need to give for students that it really helped me um, concretize I'm just that. gonna bring up your dev course so for you. So now we're gonna bring up my course. So I teach a class that's called um, Gender and Inequality in America, and it's a 300 level uh, uh, arts and humanities uh, GEP course through American Studies and Gender and Women's Studies. And this course is divided, I've always sort of divide courses into units because that's how I think. And so we have three units that we'll look at in a minute on here. Uh, the first unit is sort of uh, a sort of introduction to terms unit. And then we do two unit long case studies, one about uh, immigration and labor and another about um, uh, the prison industrial complex. So this is what my class looks like. I'm getting there. <laughs> In a second. It's, it's beautiful. I cannot, th Mary, I cannot thank you enough. You made my class look so shiny. <laughs> it's got like pictures and like, ja, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I didn't know it could look so fancy. Um, so, I mean, look at that, right? There's like a, I know, yeah. I know. Okay. It's Mary Ann, man. You're, you're in control. Well, like, can you fix it so it's not so big? I'm sorry, am I ruining your work? <laughs> yes. Yes. Actually. How's that? Is that good? No, it's just fine. Oh, gosh. Can we all get a banner? There we go. Okay, so here's my beautiful banner, which Marianne made using the Gender Women's Studies logo. So we're branding here, y'all, branding. Um, and uh, I like that it starts the students right here with the description. I need to add some things in here still about. Um, sort of expectations of text. I'm going to steal your idea of, of an adaptive release quiz about how to use Blackboard to make sure folks are on it. 
um, <laughs> your idea, y'all's idea. So um, this is the, the sort of the start page is going to take them here um, and tell them where to go. And then these are the course modules. And the structure of them was really helpful for me, I think, because it uh, tells students right away in a really clear way how t the course is going to run. So um, I, I put, here's the goal. And you will see, if you went through my course with a fine tooth comb, you would see so much repetition. So part of me is anxious that all this repetition will be confusing, but I'm hoping that it will actually help. Um, so we'll see. So this is what the modules look like. Um, putting the objectives and assessments right here, and they can have a sense of their grade right away. And then the module works through um, the reading. So I, like you, used to just use course documents. I didn't even divide them into folders. I just put all the documents there in the order that I decided to put them up. And then that's just, to me now, doesn't make any pedagogical sense. Um, one issue that I've had that this, this um, ADP workshop has made me aware of um, uh, issues around disability and accessibility in a way that I've never been aware of them before. So trying to find um, streaming media that is actually accessible and has um, and has captions has been really, really challenging. So for example, they need to watch misrepresentation. I need to do a little tweaking because this is actually someone talking about the film. So. Um, that film is only available streaming if the library pays $350 a year, uh, or students can watch it on Netflix, but I can't guarantee all students have Netflix, or they can, so one of the ideas that I had was that this would allow them to watch a lot of the media outside of class, and that's turned out not to be true, especially for independent films and documentaries, many of which are not captioned because the captioning process is so expensive. So now I'm thinking about the paper I'm gonna write about captioning. Um, because it's really expensive. YouTube videos are often captioned, but they're captioned terribly. I made the mistake of showing one without watching the captions beforehand this semester, and uh, thinking about how much my deaf student was missing was, yeah, it's totally changed how I think about accessibility. And this is a topic I've never hear, really hear my colleagues talk about, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, also, each module has a main discussion board that will help um, that is mostly what they're doing outside of class. So I first did discussion boards uh, when I was teaching winter session, but I had to be at this workshop. So I sort of practiced that. And uh, I teach in uh, gender and women's studies, and where I teach, we are super hyper suspicious of online teaching because how do you get the personality of the instructor? We're talking about really sensitive materials. What if someone says something terrible on the discussion board? You know, really, really super racist or sexist. Um, and actually launching these discussion boards has helped me get some actual arguments against that, which you couldn't do, which I couldn't do before. Um, short answer, people are going to say terribly racist things all the time. That's why there's students in your class, because they need to learn. But the discussion board um, for each section is um, linked to on the unit. Wait now, I don't know how to get there. Shh. Okay. Go back to the top. Okay. Sorry. Even higher. Sorry. Now I'm, you know, now I'm all nervous. Okay. So then when you can go. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So the discussion board. Um, Okay, I'm not logged in, but the discussion board has the, the sort of list of things to do, and um, they will do these, and that will form the basis for the conversation we have in class the following um, class period. So the discussion board makes them um, answer some questions and then also respond to their peers. Another thing I've learned how to do from ADP is online grading. So um, it'll pop up in my grade book. Um, I set it so that every time a student has made two posts, so their original and their response, it'll pop up and I'll be able to grade it. So that'll make grading really easy, but I'll also be able to go into the discussion board and do some moderating um, when people say uh, terrible things. Another um, um, aspect of this that I really like is uh, the way that it makes it really clear to students what the assessment is. And so we go down to the final assessment 
and this will all be done online. The other thing I really like about the hybrid model, especially for these shortened courses, is that I know that students, if they have to do, if they have an assignment due, they won't have done the reading. Isn't this true in everyone's class? So rather than that being a lost day, I can have this due on, um, I think that's a Saturday, and then class is on Monday, and so they'll, they'll, it builds in time for them to prepare for Monday's class. So, um, uh, so basically the short, the short analysis is I really, uh, the module has helped me think about student learning not just from a goals and objectives standpoint, but also to break that down into steps and to really clarify for students um, why they're doing each thing. And I remember when I first got to UMBC and I was like doing all the faculty development stuff because I wanted to keep my job. Um, uh, one of the first things I went to was how millennials learn and millennials need to be told what to do and how. And I thought, well, that's true of all of the people, <laughs> not just millennials, but this, mo this module structure means that as an instructor, I have to do that. And so I think that that's gonna help students walk through the course. So I'm teaching it as a hybrid this term. Don't tell my chair, but the goal ultimately is to turn this into a fully online class because um, I feel like, especially for shorter terms, um, accessibility for students, if it's online, they can actually do the course. A lot of students who have to work full time in the summer, um, I would like to make this available to them. Um, Oh, and one last thing. Uh, I got really sick this um, this semester with, like, I could barely breathe. My tonsils were so swollen. And so I had to miss a class, and I was able to make a video um, and post it online. And that helped me also give me an argument for my chair who's worried that our personalities are going to be lost in the classroom. Because with a video, you, your personality can be there. My cat came in the video. <laughs> Students loved it. It was fine. you know. And so I think that being able to move those videos Learning how to do that, too, I think was really helpful. So I've kind of been all over the place, but those are some of the things I learned in ADP. And this class already has 30 students enrolled in the, in the summer, so it's going to be a good test run. Um, and I talked my chair into letting me run a second hybrid course that I'm working on. Um, so hopefully we can actually make this huge jump. My lovely chair has never used Blackboard before, so this is like, we are really, we're in the trenches. Anyway, so that's my course. Marianne, thank you for making it look so pretty, because I think that really will help students go through it. Any questions? Thank you, Kate. All right. Good job. I can't. I I can't say enough about online grading. It has transformed <laughs> my life. Nothing is lost. Mm -hmm. Yep. I. Uh, no. I have the ones where I made the changes. Okay. Do you need to get your? Did you get? In, did you put it in your email? Uh, I did. Okay. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we can just load that. Okay. Go. I'm so not a Mac user. That's okay. Thank you. It's always so embarrassing when your whole like library goes up on the screen with the pictures and everything. Uh, this was after midnight. Let's do this. This is mine. Yep, this is yours. Um, can you, yeah, date. Uh, open that. Uh, that should be it revised, yes. Yeah. Revised. Yeah. Yep, that's it. I have handouts. Yeah. Oh, the wire. Oh, we all know that the Microsoft preview of the new Office on Macs is expiring in six days, so if you want to play with it. <laughs> There it is. Is my course available as well? Yep, okay, and I'll great. show some things. I'll, okay, great. I'll, I can sit here and help you with Oh, that's wonderful. You want, so you yeah, can if talk. you want to launch the PowerPoint. 
So I love PowerPoint. I'm a PowerPoint person because not only do I give all my lectures, all my courses for eight years now at UMBC and prior to that using PowerPoint, but in my full-time job, I have to make presentations all the time. So um, what I'm going to be presenting today is, whoops, where'd you go? Would phone. you click on this link? Sure. Um, is um, how I'm using my ADP training to hybridize the six-week summer course that I teach, which is in the psychology department, special topics at the university, uh, universities of Shady Grove. Did, oh, okay, that's not showing up though. Oh. And thank you to Beth Jones for giving some advertising mm -hmm. on the UMBC website. It's not showing. <laughs> Don't know. Why isn't it showing? Let me go out of the PowerPoint. Um, so let me just give you some background while we're trying to get the little advertisement, the marketing up. So I teach undergraduates in the psychology at universities at Shady Grove for UMBC. And my classes are pretty, um, I teach all the neuro classes. So I teach neuroanatomy, neuropsychopharmacology, physiological psychology. These are all courses that I made up. And um, they're pretty standard in that, you know, there's a lecture every class meeting, they do outside papers, they take tests, they take quizzes, they work in groups, they give student presentations, they have library assignments, all your classic bill of fare. Um, accountability is an issue because our population there is very bimodal. In this department, in this program, we have some really top performers who could go right to graduate school, and then there's the rest that I need to pull up. So over the years, what I've done is try to adapt my instructional and assessment tools to best fit that population. I've gone to exam-free courses. I use weekly uh, class meeting quizzes to keep them online, up to date, make sure they have their outside of class time first exposures before we meet and work with the material. I've even given two classes, one to make sure they get there, I mean two quizzes, one to make sure they get there on time and one to make sure they stay. And I'm going, this is ridiculous. And this even happens in three and 400 level classes as well. So when I wanted to teach this summer course as a special topics, uh, a course I made up on the neuroscience of resilience because there's the resilience and the neurobiology and neurochemistry is just, and the genetics is fascinating. It's just fascinating, it's exploding. And I thought this is gonna be of great interest, but it's not a topic that I can teach with these standard techniques. It's gonna to have to be a topic um, that uh, in, involves a, a very reading intensive format and class discussion. And so I piloted that with my first undergraduate class uh, last summer and uh, not surprisingly, they don't behave like graduate students, which is typically what you would, uh, the typical population that, that you would use for a reading intensive in a discussion-based class format. Um, it's kind of like pulling blood from a turnip. It's hard to get them to speak. They don't think on their feet. You know, they don't have those integrative and analytical skills as well developed in terms of academic maturity. There's a lot of individual differences. Some don't speak in class. Class. So I, it was a pilot last summer. Now I'm switching everything and going to some very facilitated discussion format, front loaded ev for every discussion session, make sure they have course outlines for everything they're going to read, stepping them through the scientific articles, giving them some framing questions to get them started. I'm even add adding introductory lectures, like 20 minute little lectures to give them background to each topic that we're going to discuss. Us. So next slide, next slide, please. So um, you can click it again. That's going to pop in. Um, so this is. I'm going to follow the presentation outline that we were given. Next slide. So this is a basic description of the course. I've given you a longer description on the flyer, and thank you to Beth for condensing this down into elevator speak and posting it as uh, marketing on the um, UMBC website. But basically, the questions that are addressed by this particular course are questions we all wonder about, and that is like, how can two individual experiences, uh, individuals experience the same stress or trauma, like a big hurricane or rape situation or combat, 
yet one emerges unscathed and is perfectly healthy for the rest of their lives without any mental health problems or emergence of psychiatric disorder, yet another has very persistent lifelong complica complications like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. Same thing, you can have identical twins with the same inherited DNA because of gene by environment interactions um, end up being very differentially vulnerable or protected against these kinds of life stressors that, that may impact one and not another. And the answers to these questions can be found in an emerging science of resilience, understanding how the brain controls emotional, cognitive, and physiological responses to stress, et cetera. So that's, that's the um, next slide, the substance of the course. So the problem is, as I've kind of preempted by explaining these are not graduate students, they don't have the skill set, they don't have the foundational knowledge to bring into this course or any of these neuro courses. The problem is that the material's difficult, it's rigorous, it's, it's science, we're reading scientific articles and publications that are not written for the lay population, although I can attempt to find spin-offs and um, other kinds of articles that like Dana Brain Foundation has some great reviews that I can use and some other resources. But they come into these classes, bare, you know, the brain's in your head, and that's what they know when they come in. So basically, I need to give them enough to understand brain structure, brain function, interworkings, what are the cells in the brain, how do they communicate via different chemicals, and what does all of that have to do with complex psychological processes like cognition and emotion and, and your basic phys your physiology, your autonomic nervous system reactivity in response to environmental challenge. So they pretty much come in with nothing, so I need to build a foundation and a science base at the same time we're exploring these concepts and these topics and subtopics, and not only getting them to assimilate that material, but also to use some critical thinking skills and, and try to analyze, compare, integrate, synthesize, and draw some real world applications and compare to some of what their foundational knowledge already is when they come in, which certainly is not neuroscience. Um, so I have um, not really changed the content, except that I'm trying to find always more digestible, user-friendly materials for them. Um, but I'm changing the presentation and all the different tools that I use in Blackboard. Um, what I need to do is keep this course reading intensive, discussion based, but also still be able to assess their mastery of content as well as retaining the discussion format, which I do face to face and in discussion boards, so that I can uh, give them an opportunity for me to observe this critical thinking and evaluation and synthesis of the material. So those are pretty much the goals. Next slide. And in order to do this, I'm using a lot of different Blackboard tools with Holly's assistance. I love the course modules that can be broken down into sub-modules. There's, there's a topic for each week, and within it, two subtopics. Within each subtopic is embedded all of the different activities that they have to perform. Those activities will roll out um, in, in open windows and close so that an activity will be open for a week, whether it's a discussion board, whether it's an online timed quiz, which is what I'm going to show you um, today, um, whether it's um, a filmed uh, a short videotape lecture that I have the PowerPoints loaded for, so I'm going to use adaptive release and give them a 20-minute lecture that I've recorded, and then that will launch the, the content for all the reading that they're responsible for and the discussion boards they have to participate in for that week or that half a week, depending on the, the sub-modules. So I'm using the modules and sub-modules, discussion boards to replace face-to-face. -face. There's been an interesting challenge there, which I'll explain, and what I'm going to talk about today is my use of timed quizzes online with multiple attempts. So I've already explained why I would like the hybrid, hybrid format to give them more time to work with the material, assess the material, digest this complex material, replace face-to-face -face, uh, interaction in in-class in discussion where some students are shy or can't think on their feet or respond very quickly to a particular topic or question or issue. 
um, but also assessing their content, it's really nice to be able to give them multiple attempts at mastering foundational material every single week at their leisure to meet a criterion level of success. So it's challenging, it's been challenging to set this up, uh, deploy it and beta test it pretending to be a student and see the different glitches and the options and things aren't always what they might seem. Next, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem again is assessing knowledge via assigned readings. We do that in discussion boards and in face-to-face -face, uh, class discussions. Uh, replacing paper-based assessments uh, that are normally used in a face-to-face -face course and this I'm doing with the timed quizzes that will be released and, and allow multiple attempts and then have a deadline and closure date. Next. So um, this is done through Blackboard assessments. This is one of the uh, quiz instructions that, that I gave them. The way that you set up the quizzes is you can give a description of the test or quiz activity. You can set up time limits. Uh, there's so many different options you can use, and the other two people aren't here, so I'm just talking to you. <laughs> I thought we would learn from each other, but they left. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, you can set this up to. Um, to, to show rubrics, to present questions one at a time or, or all together. I have it scrambled so every attempt the questions go in a different order so they can't try to memorize that I'm going to answer this and then answer that. I have it so they have to finish in one sitting. I have it so they can't backtrack. They have to go all the way through. Um, I have it so it will save and submit at the end. If they haven't finished, it will time them out and save and submit. But it's an awesome, awesome system that counts down the time remaining. It lets them know how many questions they finished and how many they have left. They can't uh, copy, uh, copy and paste, so they can't take from the quiz while they're uh, completing the quiz online and paste it somewhere else and save it for later. It's date and time stamped. And at the end, you can click OK, and immediately the students can see their right and wrong answers and the points they have earned for those, except for questions that will say needs grading that have to come for me for short answer or for essay answers. Next. And so um, then those questions come to me. They're in my needs graded component of, um, of the, um, the grade book. Um, I can read through an assigned number of points per published rubrics. I've made a lot of rubrics, but these are a problem because I noticed that when I was pretending to be a student, there's times those rubrics are available that I would not want a student to see them because it gives them the correct answer. You get half a point if you tell this much of the correct answer. You get a full point if you embellish it by adding other details, et cetera. So then when they take the quiz the second time, they've already seen the correct answer. So I, do, I need to find a way to hide those rubrics, rubrics and not make them available until after that window yeah. for that quiz has closed. So that's a problem. I can write in overall student feedback for each time they take the quiz. There's a section for that. And I can enter grading notes. For example, once I explained, oh, you picked an answer that wasn't in the choices, but it's close enough that I gave partial credit, and I wrote a, that in the grading section in grading notes. And all of that is available to the student in my grades. And it will save the highest score. Next. Thank you. So I like it because it gives immediate feedback to the student. It lets me know that there's something to be graded right away. And this is what the student would see, the number of points that they'd earned after I finished grading out of the total number available, and uh, et cetera. OK, so there's a big problem. And that problem is while they're taking the 20-minute timed quiz, Everything's great as far as they can't copy and paste or take a screenshot, but when they go back and see their fully graded quiz, you can copy and paste out of that all you want. Um, and that's, that's a problem for me, and I have to, have to kind of decide how much of a problem that is. So what if they did pull the content out and the questions and go look up the answers so that then they could enter the correct answer, answer next time? Well, haven't they worked with that material? <laughs> I mean, in the sense that you would with a take-home worksheet, which I use a lot. Um, so I'm kind of 
this is the first time I've used these short uh, timed out quizzes so that they wouldn't have enough time to get the book out and look up the answers and et cetera. Um, but the problem of test security, them being able to see the whole quiz with all of the answers when they take it the first time, and I don't want them to see the correct answers or to copy them and go look for the answers and then know the correct answers the next time. It should be a quiz. Um, and, and the way of keeping them from copying is to use this respondent's lockdown browser. So it locks the student into the screen for a duration of the exam. They can't do screenshots. They can't drag and drop, copy and paste. Um, they can't look up wikis. Now, they can take a picture from their cell phone. So some of these features allow you to require the student to put on their webcam. Like, oh my gosh, if I had to watch every student for every quiz they took through the whole course, I mean, even if they have multiple attempts and they go back and they study or they jot down some notes, I need to know this next time, they're working with the material, they're learning the material. So anyway, uh, so you have to download this software through UMBC and have every student set it up and then you put the quizzes through this Responda, uh, Responda system. Next one. Okay, so what am I gonna do next? I'm gonna use that uh, Responda system uh, to lock in the students when they're taking these 20 or 30 minute quizzes via multiple attempts every single week. I'm gonna put in adaptive release because I want them to see these really short introductory PowerPoints prior to reading assigned scientific articles that are in every module that will form the basis for uh, either discussion boards or in-class face-to-face -face discussion because they're graded on those discussions. And um, the course is about half done in the design and it doesn't start till July 7th. So I have two months left and Holly's gonna keep helping me and we're gonna keep improving and improving and I'm gonna keep beta testing and beta testing and pretending to be a student and checking everything. And then um, additional, an additional uh, issue I've had, which I think is a mini challenge, is how to run the discussion boards. Because I taught uh, fully online at UMUC through the Web Tyco system, and we had to use lots and lots of discussion boards every week, discussion boards, discussion boards, and posting, posting constantly. It's like a, it's like a barrage. It's like as an instructor, you're buried. You have to respond to every single one. And half of them, they're not saying anything which is a problem and that's why you need a rubric. But what I wanted to do for each scientific article that the students are assigned to read and they have an outline of the article, what are the important points you should pay attention to, here's some framing questions to think about when you read this article. I want there to be a question that they would answer on the discussion board. But I want every student to have a different question. So how do I assign those so that it's fair and a student doesn't say, well, hey, that's an easier question. I wish I got that question. So I'm going to use random assignment. And I thought it would be fun when they come to class on Wednesday night. They pull numbers out of a hat. They get numbers. If you pick number two, then for next week, you're answering question two on the article from Smith and Jones. And then all the the other students will respond to that answer, giving a secondary response or, or, in, or input, making comments on that answer. So that's the way that I'm going to run that. Next one. And then um, welcome comments, input, help, suggestions. Your questions you asked the other presenters were great. They really made me think about what I'm doing or what I might do different. And if you want to open my course, uh, we will see that there is already a lot there. Um, but I am using new tools, new delivery systems, doing a lot of content update. And um, we recently had a questionnaire to fill out from the psychology department chair about our use uh, of, of the hybrid courses and what we're plan our plans are and where we learned, how we learned the techniques that we're using. And I also have another idea for um, an online course that I'd like to teach. And I reached out to Sarah Lupin, a biology instructor. And when I was sitting in this very room with the very first ADP course, face-to-face uh, -face course session, go into the um, 
the weekly modules. Thank you. Uh, I said, hey, why don't we co-teach a class on the microbiome, psychobiome? This area is exploding. How gut microbia affect our psychological processes in the area of cognition, motivation, and emotion. So much that's going on in mental health and psychiatric disorders. I said, you do the nutrition, the, the you know, anatomy physiology part. I'll, I'll set the stage with what we know about brain mechanisms and psychological processes and behavior. Then we put it together with microbiome, psychobiome. I pretty much have that whole class developed except for her part. But she hasn't written me back, <laughs> so maybe I will start stalking her because I think that would be an awesome call her, uh, three three week winter online. You know, it has modules that make sense. The content is there. So anyway, so when you go to the uh, the weekly modules, I made some updates. Oh, you put a brain in. What did you do? <laughs> yes. All right. So let me see the beginning. Where's where does it first open? Oh, you put all these pictures in. Okay. <laughs> So um, basically, somewhere in here, before Holly beautified it, uh, it, it just says, the, you know, these are weekly modules. You can expect to find this in each module. Yeah, it's right here. And then each week has learning goals and, and objectives. Each week, it, uh, there's a folder that says, within this folder, you will find the scientific articles assigned for you to read. For, it's based on Monday and Wednesday nights, even though we don't meet Monday. It's a 50-50. You'll find the scientific articles, the accompanying outlines, the accompanying framing questions. You will find a quiz for each week. And in the assessments, it's all the description about each quiz, how long you have, multiple attempts, yada, yada, yada. There's PowerPoints loaded in here already. You added badges. I have no idea what those are. Um, but there's PowerPoints in here. Um, I will load the very short 20-minute filming uh, films of me delivering the PowerPoints and make adaptive release so they have to watch that before they then gain access to the more complex readings that they're being assigned. The quizzes are on textbook chapters. We don't discuss them in class. They're more foundational. They complement and provide um, provide related material to support the scientific readings that, that we are discussing in class on the, on, and on the discussion boards. And I know that sounds like a whole lot of stuff, it's but really well we're using though. all yeah. these tools. Yeah. We're trying to simplify it more into um, where it's going to be more sequential than it is actually clicking on certain things. So we're, we've been talking back and forth about how we're going to make, make it a little bit better designed in terms of the logic and the sequence of information and what students need to know for class and Wednesdays and what they need to do while they're outside of class. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. If they have multiple attempts on quizzes, then why are they time? So they don't sit there with the open book? Does um, that not make sense? I don't want them to be I'm open not sure. book Are tests. the questions randomized in that? They um, will be each time they take it. So you have a, you have a set of just, uh, questions that yes. change as you go. But, well, they're, they're just in a different order. So, okay. So, so they can't I memorize. Just making a test bank of questions that could be randomized. That would be um, so much harder for them. But if you're going to let me take the test over and over again, you're going to keep asking me the same questions, why not just not have a time to let me have a textbook? Not have a time. You're essentially to giving them exposure to what you're assessing them on if you allow multiple attempts. I think what Sherry is saying is if you have different questions dealing with the same concepts but not the same questions, then multiple attempts will not do what I think you're concerned that they will do, and that's that they will benefit from prior exposure on the final attempt. I don't understand. Is the idea to eventually everyone gets 100 on the quiz? It's the school. criterion of at least 80%, okay. and then they'll stop. Okay. So yeah. I think the, the way I'm understanding their concern is, um, it's not really a concern, it's just a question. Like, if, um, if your goal, because once I take the quiz and then I learn the, and then I know what to do, I grab my textbook and I look it up and then I take the quiz again yes. so I can get. Yes. So why have them be timed separate attempts? Well, if about the same question. Why not let them, why not have open, open book? Yeah. Is that or why not just have a single deployment? Why not have, why just have one, a single deployment and then they can you can have a timer on it or whatever it constraints. If you want it to be open book, then you can have an open book or you can have thirty minutes or whatever time is relevant for you. But just have a single deployment. Otherwise if they have multiple attempts, 
then you're giving them the exposure, and then they're going to go, oh, I can go and look up this information right. and take it again. That's so what you I want, want them, them to do. Yes. So why not just put them Otherwise, on, I would have an open it. book, an open, it? a worksheet. Why time it? Uh, so they can't sit there with the book open and find the answers? But so that there's some memory them, incorporated them that's being the assessed? By having multiple attempts. Right. Did you say at the beginning you don't give exams? Right. Did I hear you say that? Right. Exam free, just little quizzes. So you're even in the face to face. Right. To Weekly quizzes. Assessment rather yes. And as a practice for the final. Correct. No finals. No. The way they're assessed in this course is by the the quizzes from the textbook chapters, and from their input in discussions that are face-to-face -face or the online discussion boards. They also um, have to keep a journal, so they're graded on reflections. Um, and I think those are, that's where all the points come from. I don't think there were yeah, points anywhere else. And quizzes. I mean, Holly and I can sit down and talk more about okay. what your goal is with the quizzes and what maybe some ways to improve what you're doing. Okay. Any Let's other, do that. Any other questions? Because I could not. So much work. Wow. I know. And I only have three weeks out of six. And I'm also, um, it's taking so long because I'm trying to improve the, uh, the materials I'm using for them to pick those that are best suited for, the, for this student population. And then to do outlines and framing questions for every single article. And each week has like five to six or seven articles. So it's very reading intensive. Um, yes, I would very much like to talk about it because in all my other classes I use take home open book worksheets. And they're, um, so their grade comes from completing those worksheets as well as taking in class weekly quizzes because the literature shows that Frequent assessments, I think, are best for learning, but also I think that interacting with material, like having to find it, having to express it in your own words, um, it, and using a lot of different, a lot of different um, skills at one sitting, rather than just regurgitate and dump, um, is a better way for active learning than just tests. But I had a different idea for these quizzes. If I were going to do what you were describing and have an open book, I would do take home open book worksheets, which I typically do. But I want to replace the in-class quizzes where there's some aspect of memory that's being assessed. Their, their, their recall, their memory and their recall of the material they have read and studied, not their ability to look it up and find it. They're completely different things. And so I had, I just have different goals for what I, how I would like to assess them using memory. Whereas where I'm assessing other skills that they have in the discussion format, and whether it's face to face or online. I don't want to, I don't want to make a big point of it. I think you guys follow up, but if your goal is to assess memory, mm -hmm. giving them multiple attempts is not testing. So because if I have 10 questions and I don't know the fifth one, uh -huh. all I know is I just need to keep taking it and harvesting the questions as I go along, and then I can give you 100%. That is not a test of memory. What do you mean by harvesting? As you take, as I, you retake the test over and you give yeah. multiple attempts. I'm so in, in my first attempt, I know two questions. In my right. second attempt, I know the next two questions. Right, that's good. And as I go through five questions, five tests, and I get two questions uh -huh. each, my sixth attempt will be 100%. Okay. It's not a test of memory. You, you mean they're using trial and error? Is that your hypothesis? If you're using multiple attempts. I can write down the answers as I go that I got correct, and then I'll take it again. And I might do it, each one is going to be under a minute. Right. So your timed quiz is conflicting with your goal of testing memory. Okay. Because of the multiple attempts. Okay. I'll have to understand that a lot better. Because right now I still do not understand. <laughs> but yes, they could write down, uh, I answered this question 
with this answer. They're going to know after the first attempt that they got 7 out of 10 correct, right? Yes. And they can see which ones they got. Yes. So I can write down a piece of paper 7 I got correct. Yes. I'm going to take it again. Well, I already know the answer. They already seven. know them. So let me go through and go you know, find And now let me know the next four. Right. So, or so, the next So three. as you say, you can harvest the answer so that by the fourth attempt, I know all the answers. I want to do is go and click them when I'm done. That's what I want. Well, that's not what you just said. Because what you said is you wanted to be able to do, yes, do what you right. do in class, which is testing what their recall is based on what they've read and what they know. Right. That's, that's what not we, what we're doing in that instance. If and then they'll go back and learn the information that they got wrong. Right, but the score that you get from the in-class test uh -huh. is what's part of their final grade, correct? Yes. OK, well, you're not going to have that aspect based on the what we, we can. We can okay. Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you. Well, final steps, and we talked about this before um, for you guys. So the final course design, for those of you who do May 15th, so we can review, do the QM review. And then we'll send out the evaluation, and then happy, go deploy your course, and tell us how it goes. And yep, and we, we want your feedback, and we're always here to support you, th um, you know, through the remainder process, even though you're not part of the ADP. You know, our department is here um, to support you. I have to say, I think the hybrid is really, it really makes it accessible. Because I got taught this class every special session. And this session, I filled at 25 almost immediately. Mm -hmm. I bumped it up to 30. I only kept it there because so many people could fit in the classroom. And so there's a demand for it. So awesome. That's, that's, that's great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.